All right, it is eight o'clock at night, <laughs> but your boy works a full-time job, so coffee it is. First off, thank you for all the support on the Phoebe video. As promised, we're gonna do a mixed tutorial now about everything that happened in the mixing stage. Let's just jump right into it here. Here is Ableton. So let's go over the layout really quick for all you like Logic users, FL Studio users. I'm sorry that you have to deal with that program. Shots fired, I know. In Ableton, what you have is all the tracks on the right side rather than the left side. Every time I click on one of these squares, you'll see the plugins right on the bottom here. If I hit this line on this side, you'll see the kind of the normal console view that a lot of you might be used to if you use like Pro Tools or Logic. These are all return tracks doing different sort of effects that might uh, kind of appear in the background of the mix. And then here is the master. That is Ableton. So you'll see here that we really have like four different groups uh, whenever it comes to the mix. We have the vocals, which are in this big group here. The bass is its own group. It's just not inside of the instrumental group. The kick and the guitar guitars are all going through this instruments group. And then the kick has its own group, although we're not using the kick out, and the guitars have their own group as well. Here's that Taylor rubber, the Martin rubber, and then the natural Martin. 12 string has its own group. I tried some pink noise, ended up turning it off in the actual mix, uh, and then just this little cymbal hit. You guys probably didn't even hear. Sounds like this. Super subtle embellishment that just sort of signifies the opening of the first chorus. Then we have our return tracks here, which we'll go over in a little bit. And then all of that is going through a master chain. I really like this master chain too. We'll go through it at the end. First off, for those of you interested, this is how I record these. I have the full track bounce for reference. These are the, this is the source material group. I have the instrumental that I use Lao Lao AI. You can see here, they've sponsored videos in the past. I use Lao Lao AI as a learning tool so I can hear each individual part. So for this video specifically, all I really needed to hear was the instrumental section alone and the vocals sort of separate from the instrumental. Let me show you why this is a really powerful way to sort of learn about a track. I'm gonna point you to something that you probably would have never heard of if we didn't rip the vocal off the instrumental. Uh, particularly this post-chorus run. It's something that doesn't even really show up in my mix unless you're listening for it. But listen how we have this non sort of like low past gritty tone from the tailor here. Listen for it on the right side. Here's that instrumental in the actual track. Did you hear how they had a 12 string jangly sort of lead in that you would have never heard uh, because it's buried under a vocal? That That's why this is really cool whenever we're doing these kinds of projects because all these little details that you hear the guitarists or any of the instrumentalists play under the vocal become much more apparent and make it really easy to A, B between your track and their track. So I really recommend using AI tools, not for like the doom and gloom way that a lot of people are portraying them. And I don't know, they might be doom and gloom. I'm not gonna act like an expert there, but using them for other really cool things that weren't ever possible uh, even like a year ago. Oh, and, and here's the vocal isolated, which has helped me a lot in the tone as well. And when your skinhead neighbor goes missing, I'll plant a garden. I don't know if this series would be possible without using AI tools to analyze these tracks. So anyways, let, let's get into the actual mix. I thought you guys might think that's enjoyable. Let's just get into the meat of it and go over the kick first, then the bass, and we'll just build from there. So you can see here that the instruments have this chain that they're all running through, which we'll get to, but the kick itself, the group doesn't have anything going on in the kick out, didn't actually end up using it. All I did for the kick is low pass it, and then I put a my favorite compressor on it. You can look at the settings here if you like. Here's what it sounds like with it or in, and without it. There's not really much to add here. It's a very basic kick. Much rounder, much heavier. All right, so now let's get into the guitars, which I know is a big sort of point for a lot of people. Here are all the guitars together and isolated.
first, let's start off with the easiest one, the Natural Martin. You can see here that the Natural Martin, this is the one without the rubber bridge attachment, only shows up in the verses. It's got a band low pass thing happening on it. And then really all the other effects are happening in the guitar group chain and then further into the instrumental chain, both of which are having a massive effect on all of the instruments within those subgroups. Really, those groups are doing more work than the actual stuff on here itself. Oh, I put so many plugins on this track to make it sound decent. <laughs> My God, this was a challenge, guys. So let's hear the Taylor and the Martin Rubber together because they're really making up primarily the, the, the sort of guitar tone. Martin. Both distorted, but both different tones. Taylor's a little bit brighter, Martin is a little bit heftier. So I left a few plugins in here so you can see the chain. Let's go ahead and group these together. There is a ton of mixed stuff here. So you can look and see what's happening and I'll make sure to open all the plugins, but to go through all of these plugins individually and in fine detail would make uh, basically a movie. This would be an hour and a half long video. <laughs> so let's talk about the Martin first on the right side. A lot of what's happening here is A, you can see here lossy, and here are my lossy uh, settings for this guitar. As I mentioned in the first video, lossy completely replaced codec. So I just turned this off here and left it in for the video so that you can see where codec was and where lossy replaced it. But before that, before lossy even touches the guitar, we have this EQ and this compressor. Now, as I've mentioned before, if you're used to a graphic EQ and you're looking at these EQ bands, it's not any different. The lowest knobs here are the lowest frequency ranges like Hertz. You can see here what we're messing with is 80 Hertz. We're not doing anything to it. We're cutting 3.2 Hertz. We're cutting 3.2 Hertz again. <laughs> I'm sorry, man. I was delirious whenever I was mixing this. And then we're adding a low pass. Only like negative two and a half decibels though. That is then going into an LA 2A emulator. So let's hear this alone on the Martin. And even though this is a clean tone, you will notice that there's a little bit of lossy because lossy is coming through on this return track, number G, we'll get to it. With it on. So before even going into any of the groups, this thing is already losing a lot of the high end. That's when Lossy comes in on the actual Martin track. So let's add that in and I'll show you my settings. Then a bit of tube emulation, cassette to crunch it. Cassette, I wish I had a little bit more poignant sort of tips for it. A lot of it for me was just messing with the pro home and micro settings on the tape and then introducing static and erasures whenever I wanted more distortion. I'm not an expert on cassette and it, you can get even more granular with it. So uh, th th that was a little bit of my approach and a lot of also messing with the input and output. Taylor, actually I had codec and cassette on it to kind of add the modulation at the end, ended up not using those and replacing them all with lossy. We have the a bit warmer, which is just a, like a tube analog distortion emulator. Another low pass, particularly cutting some of the peaky mid range, kind of the quackiness that I found whenever I was using these kind of DIY rubber bridge setups. Oh my goodness, there is so much to talk about. This is a big old chain, isn't it? The only like really significant thing whenever it comes to this chain is how compressed it is. The LA-2A, this is an LA-2A emulator, by the way. It's already a pretty aggressive sort of compressor with only two knobs. You know, there, there's not a lot of things to control the extremity of it. So you'll notice when we add on the 2A at the end of this, it will sound a lot beefier and you know it might even sound a little over bloated without the rest of the mix. A 
again, the common thing that you're noticing before we even get to the fun stuff, like the lossy and the tube distortion and stuff like that, we are darkening the crap out of these guitars. And because of that, we can actually compress them a little bit more aggressively. We saw the same thing happen with the Martin, even though it took less EQing and less uh, compression to do it. Darkening, compressing, and then we are adding all of these sort of fun candies. So whenever it comes to the Taylor, we just have the low pass. Let's add that in. And actually, I will boost this peak so you can hear the thing that I'm cutting. That tone is the quackiness that I was talking about in the first video. Again, it was way more apparent with that rubber tube that I mentioned, but it was still, you know, somewhat apparent in the babble app. Finally lossy to tie it all together. Now you might also remember from the first video that one of the things we learned from Tony Berg and Ethan Grusco was to side chain your guitar to your kick. Some of you might have understood that and understandably because I didn't flesh out that concept anymore in the first video, some of you might have been like, what the f does that mean? So let's go over it. Uh, you can see here that we have moved on from the three guitar tracks themselves and into the guitars group. So let's hear it without that compressor and then with the compressor. And in order to do that, I will need to engage the kick. What did we notice? Pretty obviously, the kick has become more prominent by turning a compressor on for the guitars. Weird, right? Well, that's because what sidechain compression is, is essentially taking one signal and using it as the hand that engages the compressor. So what we've done here, and you can see here on this sidechain tab, I'm taking audio from the kick channel, which is here, and I'm using that to engage the compressor. And you can see that on this timeline. Whenever the kick engages, you'll see the dip in volume. This allows the pulse of the song to cut through the guitars when the pulse is happening, but also allows the guitars to breathe in between those kick hits. That is super important to the tightness of this song. And if you're trying to emulate this, definitely use side chain compression. Now let's get to the fun stuff. Here is the guitar group with and without the master sort of chain. A lot of people are asking about RC20 and if RC20 was the mystery plugin. I didn't even mention it in the first video. Its inclusion is very subtle. And every time I tried to use it as the hero plugin, it never gave me the result I wanted. I left it on so you guys can see it. What it's doing to this track is very subtle, if non-existent. And then that brings us finally to the instruments track here. Let's hear it with and without this instrument change, shall we? So big, big, big old, big old, big old difference there. A lot of it is a lot of EQing and compression, and a lot of it is also this intelligent compressor that you guys know I love to use, which is Golfoss. I introduced a little bit more brightness on the chain, as you might have heard, but it's mostly a presence boost around 1K to like four or five, six K. And then Goldfoss is doing the same thing. It's brightening and sort of kind of trying to hold together all this low end that we've built up, doing it with its sort of intelligent real time EQing. Uh, this Katelnikov shouldn't be here. <laughs> Let's just delete it. Here's the bass. Uh, I'm not really gonna go over the bass. We got a lot to get through and it's pretty simple. Low pass, insane low pass. Bass simulator. All righty, right, let's get to the vocal. I used this Phoebe double here as just a reference in the track. Um, it's not actually on, I'm gonna delete it. So we have the octave down take, which is me. Now I'm gonna show you my raw vocals. Um, please leave me alone, they're terrible. <laughs> I can't believe I'm about to show this to thousands of people. So here's with the chain. <sighs> I don't know when you got taller. See our reflections in the wall. All right, you get it. I can't sing, and I used Metatune to make it so that it was kind of on key, but it's only good when it's under Jess's voice. But a lot of it is really aggressive EQing and compression, 
to try and make a big, loud, bassy body, but basically cut all the vocal detail in my voice. That's why you can see this stupid looking EQ curve here. I scooped out everything and basically tried to treat my voice a lot like you would treat the EQs on the guitars and the bass to leave detail for Jess, the one who actually knows how to sing. I don't know when you got taller. See our reflections in the water. All right, that's done. Moving on. I had to show you and now I did it and now we're done. Let's talk about the main vocal. The main vocal looks like it doesn't have a lot on it. I, I did have Metatune on, but very, 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 very slightly. Uh, it's really only doing very subtle things and we'll get to automation at the end of this tutorial because I, uh, I automate when she's even using autotune. So I ended up actually using a lot of Slate stuff. I use a lot of Slate stuff all the time, but it really came in clutch on this track particularly because it has a lot of these vintage emulators that Ableton does not have. This is an 1176 emulator, if you're familiar with the 1176. Uh, this is just, it sounds a lot like analog distortion, uh, and this is that too. Someday I'm gonna live in your house up on the hill And when your skinhead neighbor goes missing I'll plant a garden in the yard Then they're gluing roses on a flatbed You should see it I mean thousand. We used a vocal double in the chorus. It's just a different take from the bunch of takes that we did, and uh, I put it underneath it. You got taller, see your reflections in the water. Off a bridge at the Huntington. All right, uh, and one thing you will also notice that the, the mix is very wet without the instrumental underneath her vocal. The reverb is a lot more wet than it sounds in the full mix because it kind of gets squashed down and when they start to share all that harmonic information, it doesn't sound as wet. So I understand that the reverb sounds huge compared to the actual mix, but it doesn't inside of the context of the mix. Then the only thing I have turned on in the vocal group is Gulfas. The 12 string has its own set of EQs. We can see we did have Kodak here and we did have a little bit of RC20. That's adding a bit of like a chorus effect. And I also have Kilohertz chorus adding a chorus effect. The codec that we have going on here is incredibly weak, by the way. We actually have two different guitars making up our fake 12 string. We have the Taylor playing a natural line, and then we have the Taylor playing a rubber line, and this is an electric that I ended up not using. The rubber. That'll give us a little bit of attack and pluckiness on the initial hit of the 12 string. Together they sound like this, the left side. I wanna go over the graveyard. This is just a good mix practice, I think, to have if you can. Maybe not as crazy as me. You don't need to leave like the plugins and stuff on it. Basically put any track that might be of use later, but is currently not of use inside of the graveyard. So you can see here all of the different takes that didn't make it, dude. Like this is something to really keep in mind here is, uh, you know, a few things got pulled out of the graveyard for use later, but look at how much it took to make this, you know, like you're not gonna get it right. You're not gonna get it right for several times in a row. And you have to be willing to go through all of these takes, see what works and see what doesn't. If you're really trying to get into a sound, my computer can handle it, thankfully. I know this would kill a lot of computers, but it's always good to kind of save it if you can and then pull it back from the dead. If for example, you need like one phrase, let's say like your main take was perfect except for like one phrase. And then you had another vocal take and this did happen in our mix. That was not usable for most of it, but that one phrase actually worked out pretty well. Put that phrase in the comp of the final vocal. And that happened several times. So keep your takes if you can. 
delete the plugins on them if your computer starts to be pissed at you for it. We have a few things happening with the master and with the return tracks. If I go to our other console tab, you'll see A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. These are the same as A, B, C, D, E, F, and G up here. Now each of these has one or a couple of effects on them that is basically giving a tone that we can feed in and mix in to taste. The main vocal, for example, about 85% of that vocal is being sent to our Verb Classic Suite. This is another Slate emulator. And then I can mix this to whatever I think is the right value for this track. And this is a really great way to be non-destructive with your main takes while adding tones underneath it to give it more depth. Stuff like reverbs and delays, like the repeater here, is pretty much par for the course. But you can also do stuff like parallel compression, which is something I always talk about. You can see here that our main vocal has about 50% of the signal going to a parallel dark. So with the parallel compression track here, you can see here I have a compressor, but then I also modify it by making a high pass and adding an analog warmth to it, and I mix this tone to taste. So here's the main vocal through that parallel tone, so you can hear it by itself. And when I grow up, I'm gonna look up from my phone and see my life. We add that in with our main vocal, we get uh, just a bit more harmonic interest by adding two tones and summing them together. And when I grow up, I'm gonna look up from my phone and see my life. And it's gonna be just like my recurring. You can see here, one of them is an instance of cassette that happens after a band pass, for another example. One of them is codec, that is just adding a bunch of straight up noise. Not useful on its own, very useful as a texture underneath everything. And then also, of course, we have a lossy return track. Sounds like this. This return track was crucial for adding that kind of glitchy glue across all of the stereo image. I can't emphasize this enough. Return tracks and send tracks is another kind of example of these kind of things. You could also call them parallel processing. Parallel processing is something I don't see enough beginners experimenting with. Okay, so the master. Let's hear it without the master on. I don't know when you got taller. And with it on. I don't know when you got taller. See your reflections in the water. Obviously, 90% of us are going to like the master version better. But don't be fooled. I say this every time. A lot of it is volume. We have a certain level of volume going into the final sort of export of this song. Let's see what it is without the master track on. I don't know when you got taller. It's super quiet. Even for uh, most tracks, we would be usually trying to hit around negative six dB FS. So it's pretty quiet. It, it's probably quieter than it should be. Uh, and this brings it up to a right volume of a little bit less than zero dB FS. And humans just naturally like more volume. Uh, that's why the loudness wars exist. So don't be too fooled by it. But I do think this mix is actually doing a lot of cool stuff. TDR Kotelnikov, it is a free mastering plugin. You should download it. It's some of the best mastering presets I've seen of any compressor, whether you're paying for them or not. Uh, I use the smooth or the warm preset all the time and then just kind of fiddle with the knobs. Let's see how much reduction it's doing. You should see it. I mean thousands I grew up. So with a threshold of negative 31 decibels, and if you need a lesson on compression, it's an old video, but it's a good video. I'll link it here. At that threshold, we're reducing around negative three decibels, which is kind of aggressive for a mastering compressor, I will say, but we're gluing a lot of this stuff together pretty well. This is really just trying to cut some of the buildup in the mid range that happens whenever the vocals and the instrumentation start to meet in this final master. Then another mastering compressor, it, it's really not doing much reduction. Uh then the glue and roses on a flat bed you should see it it's compressing peaks but as soon as that peak is gone it's sort of flattening it out and it's really just regulating the the final sort of offensive notes that might be just a little bit too loud for 
the rest of the mix. Uh, it's got a ton of makeup gain though. It's got 9.6 decibels of makeup gain. We're boosting a lot in this plugin. This plugin is mostly just to, as it says, make it loud. And then a limiter adding another 3.7 decibels and stopping the mix from getting any louder than negative 0.3 decibels. That's what this means here. Only other thing to mention, and something that I, again, see a lot of beginners not doing is using something called automation. Automation is essentially little invisible hands that can control these knobs depending on the part of the song. If you look on Ableton, this little icon here pulls up automation. Uh, and anytime that you see a little red dot, that means that that part of the mix is being automated. Inside of the mixer panel, I could automate how much reverb is on the track. Probably the most popular thing to automate, the most standard thing to automate is track volume. We actually drop in volume in the chorus, that's where this section is. Uh, we boost up in volume for the next verse, and then the final chorus gets dropped again, and that's mostly just so the other doubles and, and the vocal harmony can mix in with the lead vocal and make a big sound without one being overblown. And this is absolutely not just an automation lane on lead vocal. You can see here that the kick gets automated. The kick loses volume in the second chorus. The instrumental group gets a ton of automation. The EQ actually changes for the instrumental group. We can see here that frequency band four, this one right here, actually changes frequency depending on the part of the song. Let's see where it changes. Surprise, we actually introduced more harmonic information into the mix whenever we went to the instrumental section. Basically, the guitars are getting out of the way during the verse where the vocal is, and whenever the vocal is in there, we can give the guitars a little bit more harmonic information to be a bit brighter and more forward. This also happens on Golfoss. I'm telling Golfoss to use the brighten feature on the instrumental section. Also to lower that brighten feature whenever the vocals come in. And because we know that that little red dot means that it's being automated, you can see here the amount of signal being sent to the return lanes. Remember these A, B, C, D, E things? Is also being automated. There's much more reverb in the first half of this song, then it drops out towards the second half of the song. Automation is very important. You should definitely consider that whenever you're tightening up the and, and kind of adding the final sparkle to your mix. This is a very dense mix as opposed to the Radiohead mix. This one is a lot. So I hope it was helpful and I'll see you around for the next forensic productions. Bye-bye.